Um, thank you all. Is my audio being projected out there into the world? Uh, thank you all on the internet or in cyberspace or whatever that is um, for coming tonight. Uh, so, I, you know, I was thinking, um, what, are the, what are the issues, you know, that we, we are confronted? What, what keeps you guys awake at night? Now, my guess is that what keeps you guys awake at night is, uh, you know, whatever's going on in college and who you've woken up with recently or, who, who, you know, stuff that is really in your day-to-day -day lives. And that makes sense. But I can tell you what keeps me up awake at night are my two sons. Um, and it's, uh, it's not because, you know, I worry about what they're doing out there um, in the world. Uh, both of them are about your age. Uh, or this, at least uh, those of you are students. Uh, my youngest son is a freshman in college. My oldest son is a senior in college. So they're both, um, you know, about your age. And what worries me is what future they have. What worries me is what kind of world are they going to be facing in 10, 15, 20, 30 years? You know. Worries me what kind of job market they're going to be get, you know, that it, it's going to, they're going to be exposed to in just a few months and, and in, in the coming years. But, but really, my biggest concern is that long term perspective. Five, 10, 20 years. What does the world look like if we just continue the way we are today? If we just continue with the kind of ideas that exist in the world today, with the kind of debate that exists in the world today? And let, let me give you just a few. Highlights of my concerns for the next uh, 20 years. Now, I was just reading a report um, just last week that was published by a woman named Mary Mika, and you can you can find her stuff on the web. Um, this is it's a it's a PDF and it's a PowerPoint presentation, and it's it's fascinating. And what Mary Mika has done, she's a financial analyst. Now, what she did was she took the United States government and she said, "I'm going to look at the United States government as if it were a company." And I'm going to value it, right? I'm going to give it a value like the stock market value. What is the net worth of the U.S. government, right? So you take the assets and you take liabilities and you compare them and you look at future liabilities and future expected income. And you look at what is the bottom line for the U.S. government. And the numbers she comes, now she uses government numbers. She uses uh, Congress, Congressional Budget Office numbers. Um, so these are kind of, these are quite conservative numbers. She's not left wing. She's not right wing. She's trying just to be a financial analyst. And she's not taking really radical assumptions, simple assumptions that, you know, most people would say are probably overly conservative. In other words, overly positive in terms of where the economy is going. Um, she places a value in the U.S. government of negative $40 trillion. That's 40 million millions. Right? If you think about what a million dollars is, it's 40 million of those. I mean, it's an incomprehensible number. Now, just to give you a sense, the U.S. economy is about, and again, these aggregate numbers are not that meaningful from the economic perspective, but they give you kind of a ballpark. This economy is about a $15 trillion economy. So our, our net worth is three times negative, right, than what we produce every year. These are staggering, staggering numbers. This is debt that is hard to imagine. By 2025, only 14 years in the future. Now I know for you guys, 14 years is a lifetime. When you get to my age, 14 years is not that big of a deal. I remember 14 years ago. Most of you probably don't. In 14 years, all the income, all the income, coming into the U.S. government, all tax revenue combined will pay for four things. Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and interest payments on the debt. That's it. No money for defense, no money for any other program. Just those four. And then after 2025, much, much higher than what the, what the revenue is. And let's put this in perspective. Right now, Right? These Republicans got voted just recently. They got voted in 
on a radical platform of reform. The Tea Party, right? Republicans, you know, the Tea Party really backed them. So these are, they're ready to take on these problems and really bring change to Washington. We got a $3.7 trillion budget. We've got a deficit of $1.7 trillion. And they're arguing and they're debating about cutting $60 billion. Just run the numbers, that's under 2%. I mean, no company that was facing that kind of a deficit in its income statement would be talking about cutting 1%, 2%. They'd be talking about cutting 10 20 30%. But this is the kind of squabbling that goes on. And you know, nobody will touch the big items that I just mentioned, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Of course, you can't do anything about the interest payment on the debt as long as you're accumulating debt you're going to get more interest payments that you have to make. And right now is a good time because interest payments are really low because interest rates are really low. It ain't going to last. And it's not just, uh, you know, on the national scale, California is bankrupt, Illinois is bankrupt, New York is bankrupt, Michigan State is bankrupt. On a local level, financially, things are just in catastrophic condition. And it's not like anybody has solutions or presenting solutions right now that solve the problem so that in 10, 15 years, I feel comfortable. Okay, well, we're going through hard times right now, but things are going to be good in the long term. Again, nobody is talking about ideas. Nobody's talking about anything fundamental. Or take foreign policy. Again, you guys probably only vaguely remember 9-11, but 9-11 was a real shock to the system. Terrorists came all the way to the United States and killed 3,000 Americans with the intention of killing many, many more. The leaders of those terrorists are still around. They're still alive, still plotting, still doing what they think will lead, ultimately, to killing more Americans. And we have done almost nothing to stop them. Yet, we're in wars in Iraq, we're in wars in Afghanistan, and we're in war in Libya that seemingly are completely unrelated to that event in 9-11 and that nobody can really explain why we're there and what we're there for, and how long we're going to be there, and how we're going to leave. And, and this is, these are little teensy bitsy wars when there's a big country called Iran that's building nuclear weapons, and who knows what they're going to do once they get those nuclear weapons, and whether they put your lives at risk in 5, 10, 15 years. The world right now is being really challenged. The United States has never faced the situation that it faces today. It's faced foreign conflicts before, but at least at home, economically, culturally, it was solid. Today, we are rotting from within, and we're spread all over the world fighting wars that nobody understands, that nobody can explain. And nobody is presenting any kind of solutions. Nobody is looking at that long term and saying, here's where we go. Here's a vision for America. Here's a vision for where we need to go. And the reason is that there are no fundamental ideas out there. Think about the debate about Libya, because it's a it's a it's right in the headlines right now. Obama gives a speech every couple of days to try to justify why we're doing this. But think about what's driving our involvement in Libya. What are the ideas that are driving this involvement? And think about whether those ideas are connected in any way to Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and kind of our, our government problems. Is Libya somehow related to what's going on with our budget? Well, why are we in Libya? Why are we going out and bombing, you know, the, 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 uh, those who oppose Gaddafi in Libya and, you know, a, nice, uh, a no-fly zone, which was supposed to just knock down airplanes. Now we're knocking down, uh, you know, tanks and artillery and just anybody. Anybody who we think is a pro Gaddafi, we're, we're leveling, but we're not killing Gaddafi. We're not there. All we want is to level the playing field. We want to make it as easy for the rebels to kill Gaddafi soldiers as it is for Gaddafi soldiers to kill the rebels. We want to make it an equal playing field. Now, where does that even idea come from? We are spending a billion dollars in every one of these cruise missiles, a, a, a million, I'm sorry, a million dollars in every one of these cruise missiles. We're spending billions of dollars over there. 
why? What are we going to get? What is your life? How is this going to contribute to any of our life? Is anybody even asking those questions? Why, Obama tells us, are we going into Libya? And why is everybody defending it? Because the Libyans need us. They need us. The, the, lots of civilians will die if we don't go and help the Libyans. The standard there is not, explicitly not, and Obama makes a real effort to make it clear that the standard is not what's good for you. The standard is not what's good for us Americans. The standard is the Libyans need us, and we can't abandon them in that time of need. Of course, the Rwandas need us, and there are people who live in Congo need us, and there's a civil war going on in Ivory Coast right now that nobody's talking about, and thousands of people are dying there, and they need us, and the Yemenites need us, and the Bahraini need us, and, you know, they, there's no lack of need for America to come in and help people. But the standard is their need. And then we're selective about who, who we go after, which need we satisfy and when. So need is the standard. And the fact that it's going to, you know, that we're putting American lives at risk, the fact that we're spending gazillions of dollars, that doesn't matter. And when you push them and you say, but what is America's interest in it? What is America's interest in it? Well, they tell you, you know, if we could, if we could only defeat Gaddafi, that would get rid of a really, really bad guy and things will just get better somehow and things will be much more stable in the Middle East and we all benefit when bad guys get eliminated and there's stability out there. And this is really a long-term, you know, long-term vision. And, you know, strategically, this is long-term important for the United States. Which is their attempt to somehow bring it into self-interest. But they're not really, you know, they're not really committed to this too strongly. Because if they were committed to this, what would they have done a year ago, two years ago? Well, Gaddafi was still a bad guy back then, right? He didn't change. Nothing changed. But back then, he was our ally, somehow. There's no commitment to ideas. So there are two, two, in a sense, two strategies. Call them strategies, even as a stretch. One is, we go where we're needed, where people want us, where they need our help, where they're suffering, and we'll go and help them. And the standard there is other people's well-being. The alternative is, you know, we'll kind of fudge it as we go along. We'll kind of make it up. There are no principles. There are no standards. Call that pragmatism. And the other one, altruism. These are ethical views. These are philosophical views around the world, about the world. Take this foreign policy example. Ayn Rand presents us with an alternative view. And that view is self-interest. Your life belongs to you. You are sovereign over your own life. You have moral responsibility over your life. The purpose of your life is to make your life the best that it can be, the most fulfilling that it can be. The goal of government is to leave you alone, to protect you from force, from foreign invaders, from bad guys, so that you can live your life to the full. We'll come back to that. Now apply that to this issue of Libya. Are the Libyans interfering with my ability to live my life? Not really. They're not trying to kill me, as far as I know. They're not trying to steal my stuff. Why are we there? Simple analysis. The principle is, is it in my self-interest to intervene in a crisis in Libya? Or isn't it in my self-interest to intervene in a crisis in Libya? And it's our individual self-interest, not some amorphous national interest in the long term, maybe, whatever. But is it in myself? It doesn't make my life better. And would any one of us, here's, here's the test I use for wars. Is this a war you would volunteer to go fight? Is this a war you would want your children to go fight? You know, I have sons. What I tell my sons, you know, this is one where you should go volunteer. This is this is. This is about your life, about your freedom. No, it's not. I can't tell them I want them to go fight this war. I couldn't tell any of you. I can't tell anybody who walks in with a military uniform that this is a battle I want them to fight. Because it's not a battle for them. It's a battle for some need that the Libyans might have. 
And I haven't even started talking about it, and I won't, about who these insurgents are, or who these, uh, you know, who the opposition to Gaddafi really is, and whether they're our friends, and whether they're better for us or worse for us. You know, you could do a whole analysis just on that. The point is, there's no American self interest. So, Ayn Rand would say, Jacobism would say, we shouldn't be there. But if need is your standard, if other people's need is your standard, which is the conventional morality we all grow up with, right? When we're little, what are we taught? That good equals what? Good equals being selfless. Good equals placing your own interests last. Good means sacrificing for others. Good means being focused on the interest of other people. Other people's needs, according to the morality we all grow up with, is a claim against you. The fact that somebody else needs something means you are morally responsible for fulfilling their need. That's conventional morality. Now, what about in Libya? They need stuff. We have stuff. We have weapons to help them. We have money to rebuild the country afterwards. We are wealthy, we are strong, we are successful, therefore, we have a moral responsibility to help them. That is conventional morality. To say, I'm not going to help them. You know, if they want to kill each other, and if a lot of people die, it's sad. It's always sad when people, innocent people die. But it's not my business, and I'm going to stay out of it. You know, whether that happens in there, or in Rwanda, or in anywhere else. To say that requires the negation of this moral ideal that need is the essence of morality. That somebody else's need is a moral claim on your life. That your focus needs to be their interest, not your own. And that's why nobody, nobody, even people who oppose this war, will say, well, it's their business, not ours. Because that is very self-assertive, self-interested, egoistic. And what do we know about self-interest and egoism? Those are not good. Not from the perspective of conventional morality. Conventional morality says, again, you should be selfless, not selfish. Selfish is bad. Self-interest is bad. So that plays out in foreign policy. And what are the pragmatists? What are the people in the middle who I said kind of vaguely have this idea that there's some self-interest, but it's long-term and it's wishy-washy, and it's never, they never hold it on principle. They're kind of the people who've abandoned morality anyway, because they say, look, this altruism, this selflessness doesn't work. It's not practical. We can't get anywhere in life with it. And being an egoist, well, that's clearly immoral, and that's wrong, and that's bad. So we're just not going to care about morality, and we're just going to go through life doing whatever seems to work in the moment. That's the essence of this pragmatic view which is unprincipled, unfocused, changes all the time, no real long-term view. It's just whatever, in a sense, the urge is. So is this connected at all to domestic policy, to the domestic concerns that we have, for example, about you know, the budget right now and, and the inability to, to, you know, to cut spending? Well, I think it is. Because think about, think about what we're talking about here. Cutting something like, let's take, let's take Medicare. Medicare is a program that provides health benefits to the elderly. Once you hit 65, you can start you know, participating. Um, and it, it's basically subsidized health care, subsidized by the taxpayer. Because we pay our Medicare tax, but the Medicare tax doesn't even come close to paying the actual expenses that get expensed on health. Now, why is it that we are willing to basically tax everybody in order to provide health care, unlimited amounts of health care, to the elderly? And if in the case of Medicaid, it's to the poor. What is it that leads us to that? It doesn't make any economic sense. It doesn't make any sense in terms of quality of health care. What happens when you give something to somebody for free? What are they going to do? If you, make, if you make the price of a product zero, basically, to the person purchasing the product, how much of the product are they going to purchase? A 
a lot, right? Cost us to them. So people overuse healthcare. They spend a huge amount on it because it's not coming out of their pocket. Every procedure is okay because it's not coming out of their pocket. Prices go up. The system is starting to crumble. Everybody understands this. This is economics 101. It's no surprise. Then why is it that nobody is willing to talk about Medicare? Or cutting it, privatizing it, doing away with it. We propose them for vouchers, all kinds of proposals out there, but nobody takes them seriously. Medicare is one of those parts of the budget that nobody will challenge. Indeed, what is going to happen is the solution is going to be to ration care. Instead of uh, everybody being able to access everything, there'll be a government committee that decides what procedure you will get, what procedure you will get, and how long you're allowed to live, and whether your cancer should be treated in way X or in way Y. That, that is inevitable because the costs are going out of control. So the only way to reduce the cost is to, is to be blunt about it, to kill us young, because the older we get, the more we consume. This is obvious. Again, this is not complicated. This is economics 101. So why is nobody willing to put Medicare on the table? Well, because people need health care. They, they need this, right? Once upon a time in the 60s, the perception was that old people weren't getting as good a health care as other people, and they needed it. And how can we watch somebody suffer and not get the kind of health care treatment that we know is possible in some idyllic world? We need a provider. Their suffering is a moral claim on our lives. How can we stand back and not help them? We've been taught, again, since we were this little, that it's our moral responsibility to help those in need. As long as we hold that premise, we cannot touch Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security and welfare and all the, all the other benefits that are being given. Even farm subsidies. How do they justify farm subsidies? They justify farm subsidies because the small, poor farmer needs it. He'd go out of business if they didn't have it. Well, join the club. How many farmers have gone out of business? How many farmers have left the farms and come into the cities over the last hundred years? About 90 plus percent of them. But here's, and in the always came. Come up with the images, right? There's always an image of a small farm somewhere that if you cut the subsidies, they will go out of business and they will, and it's, we all need to subsidize them because it's our moral responsibility. Their suffering is on us. But again, if you look at it from the perspective of Ayn Rand, if you look at it from the perspective of self-interest, of what is really good for me in the long term, then I don't want to subsidize farming. And if you look at it objectively, it's quite easy to see that you know, the subsidies, first of all, don't go to these small farm loads, even if they do. You know, it's not my responsibility. It's not my business. Why are you taking money out of my pocket and handing it over to him? I, I, I want to help my kids go through college. I want to buy a nice car. I want to live my life. I want to start a new business. Why are you taking my money to help people with health care? If I want to help them, I'll do it. But why are you taking my money? Why are you redistributing? Why are you sacrificing my life for theirs? Because that's what it is. It's all about sacrifice some group to another group. It's all about this ethical question of, is your life yours? Or does it belong to those in need? Or does it belong to some group? Or is it just, are you just a slave of the majority, of 51% of whatever they decide, of whatever they think is right? The key question is, whose life is it? Whose life is it? And the answer to that question is the answer to all these public policy issues. Wherever you fall on that question, will dictate what kind of public policy agenda you want. If you are, if you fall on the side of my life, well, your life is yours, my life is mine, then you don't want government telling you what to support and what not to support and who to help and who not to help. You want to live. You want to be able to use your money, use your talent, 
Use your mind. Use your skill in whatever way you think is going to promote your values in your life. Ideas matter. Fundamental ideas matter. Ideas and ethics matter. What you believe, ultimately, about what is right, about who your life belongs to, is going to dictate all these questions, all the answers to all these questions. And it's clearly dictating it today you know, in, uh, in our uh, public policy world out there. And of course, that's just one layer. That's just one layer in ethics, you know, which we've just touched on a tiny little bit. We just scraped the surface. And hopefully we'll get we'll get some questions so we can go we can go deeper even in ethics. But your ideas about how you know what you know are gonna shape your ideas in ethics, but they're also gonna shape your ideas in public policy and they're gonna shape your ideas in everything that you do in life. Are you actually, do you actually know reality? Do you actually have a tool to understand the world around you? Is reality, this stuff, knowable? Or well, isn't it knowable? Or are you just floating around, not really knowing what's going on today, not knowing what will happen in the future? Who knows? And therefore, at the whim of somebody else who claims that knowledge. Who is going to guide you and help you? And don't worry, be happy because we know how you should live your life. Which is kind of the, the paternalistic government that we're seeing more and more of in America today. We're just too stupid to really know how to live. We're inherently irrational. You're seeing all these books out there about the virtues of irrationality, about how people are generally not good at making decisions for themselves. But what we need are philosopher kings. To tell us how to live, what foods to eat, what cars to drive. You know, you guys don't know that you should all want an electric car. And you should be willing to give up everything you own in order to get an electric car. And if you don't know that, Washington is going to prove it to you by basically taxing away your existing automobile and subsidizing the electric car so you have to buy it. So you don't have any choices about it. Or the alternative. The Ayn Rand alternative is we do know reality. We do have a tool to understand a reason. We, we can guide our lives. We can figure it out. And indeed, all the values we have around us, everything in this room, the fact that we're all here today, the fact that there, there is a university and the students out there are all products of human reason. Every achievement, everything, the fact that we can stream this over the web, all over the world, that is testament to the efficacy of reason, to the ability of the human mind. The fact that there are six billion people alive today, that we have medicines to cure diseases, that we have clothes, that we have homes, all of that is a product of thought. All of that is a product of reason. That each one of us is an individual possessed. And therefore, our lives, again, we can be responsible for our lives. We need, should be responsible for our lives. And we need to get the philosopher kings off our backs. We need to be in a position, we need freedom to be able to make the decision for ourselves. So that's another level of ideas. That depending on where you sign in, is, of course, there's a third alternative. One's a skepticism, right? One's an objective. The third alternative is, is we know what we know through mystical revelation. And of course, what does that lead to? Because I don't speak to God, so who does? Well, there's always somebody who decides that they do. And they let us know, of course, what God says, and they let us know what we should be doing. There always is an authority that tells us what God is saying at the moment and how we should behave. Again, we're all too dumb to get it. That's faith. It's called blind faith. None of this exists. But that's the criteria by which we guide our lives. So that's another layer kind of of ideas that are shaping the world around us, whether we want to or not. So just to, just to summarize, and then we'll, we'll, do a, we'll go to questions. We are faced with enormous challenges right now, you know, challenges that I have to admit, even five years ago, I did not believe would be as bad as they are today. Things are deteriorating 
faster than I ever thought they would deteriorate from a cultural, economic, and even foreign policy perspective. The world as we know it is being challenged, this country in particular, as the bastion of freedom, as a free country, as a wealthy country, as a successful country, is that those facts are, are being challenged. But what we need to change these things, what we need to move in a different direction is to challenge the fundamental ideas that our culture holds, the fundamental ideas that shape all other ideas, that shape all other policies, that shape the direction in which the country moves. And, you know, people say, well, that's impossible. You can't do that. Nobody ever does that. Nobody does such a fundamental questioning. Nobody ever gets to reverse the culture in that way. And it's rare. It almost never happens. But in this country, we need to remember that this country was established because exactly such a question, exactly such a challenge to the existing set of ideas that existed in the culture. Our founding fathers understood a principle that was revolutionary at a time. They understood that the individual owns his own life that his life belongs to him, in a culture, in a world that had never imagined such an idea. In a world, in a culture where your life belonged to a king, to society, to a priest, to the pope, to God, to somebody else, the founders understood that your life belongs to you. And they founded a country based on that principle, the first ever. It never had existed anything closely remotely like this country, in spite of what your history teachers tell you. This is the greatest country in human history. And it was the only country in human history founded on this idea of individual sovereignty. And what we need is to reconnect with that principle and provide it with a better, a greater, a stronger foundation, a foundation that I think Ayn Rand provides us. And I think that the, the key in the founding that we need to kind of hook back to is the Declaration of Independence, which, which articulates this notion that each one of us, each one of us has an unalienable right, which means a freedom, not to stuff, but a freedom to act, to go out and live our lives. We have an unalienable right to live our lives. A life, liberty, and then the most self-interested political statement in human history, each one of us has a right to pursue our own happiness. And if we can resurrect that, if we can start talking about ideas at that level, if we can just resurrect what the funny fathers had, if we can just save that enlightenment thinking in today's world and bring that back and then add on to that Ayn Rand's philosophy, that's how we're going to save this world. That's how we're going to save uh, this culture. Thank you. And we're going to take questions. Where do you want to start? Hey guys, we have a few questions. So if you're waiting in the live audience here, the and all the audiences online. So we'll start here. Um, this is the only mic that's currently, aside from Dr. Brooks, hooked up into our broadcast. So I'm going to pass the mic around to whoever wants to speak. So if you could please raise your hand or stand up if you have a question. Okay, I'll go right here. Um, I was wondering about like a Kantian standard or the golden rule of do unto others as you'd want done to you. How would that fit in with what you're saying? Um, you know, I would reject such a standard. Um, it's, it's so amorphous and it's so really meaningless that I don't think it is a useful ethical standard. The question is, what is the fundamental purpose of life? What is the fundamental purpose of morality? Um, you know, why should I do unto others as they do unto me? Where, where does that even come from? You know, and, and what do I want done unto me that I should do unto others? I mean, I want a TV. Should I give them TVs? I mean, what is it? How do you, what's the standard? Where does it come from? Uh, I believe morality has to be a lot more rigorous than that. Uh, and Rand articulates that kind of rigor. I mean, she, she uh, in, in The Virtue of Selfishness, which I encourage everybody to read the book and the essay, uh, the, the Objectivist Ethics, 
she talks about where does morality come from? How do we get right and wrong? What is the standard for right and wrong? And she, she talks about the fact that as human beings, as, as in a sense biological entities, the fundamental issue for us, the fundamental alternative that we face is life or death. All animals face that alternative. The plant has no choice about it. It automatically, you know, maneuvers itself into a position where it gets the sunlight or digs deep with its roots to get the water. We can't do that. We have to decide. We have to choose values to guide us towards life. We don't have it automatically programmed into it. But the standard has to be life. Because what does it mean to pursue values, which is what morality is about, right? It's about the pursuit of values, which values, and the important values. How do, what does it mean to pursue values outside of a context of being alive, of wanting to live? So life is the standard. Now what things should I do? What ideas should I embrace? What virtues should I embrace in order to achieve my life, and in life here, I mean every potential and the whole flourishing of human life. That's what morality, the questions morality should be asking. And then, you know, there's a lot of answers, uh, and, and, and it needs rigor in terms of how you develop those answers. What kind of virtue should I follow? And just to have a rule, you know, and, and it's interesting because that's the Christian rule, right? The Jewish rule was don't do unto others because they would not do unto you. It's, I think it's a better rule. But it, it's, it's a rule out of nowhere. Some wise man said it once, you know. But w w by what standard, you know, is the standard other people's well-being? And then I, I don't want to do other, I don't want stuff done to me that, it just doesn't go anywhere. You have to have a standard. Whose interests am I after? And then how do I get to achieve those? Questions from the University of Colorado Eagle in Denver, Colorado. What, in your opinion, is the ideal life? What, in my opinion, is the ideal life? Wow, we're getting different questions. I mean, I think there's some principles that you can put together, and then it really depends on you and what, what, your, what you love to do, what you enjoy doing. The principles are living by the virtues that lead to success, that lead to life, that lead to flourishing. An ideal life is a life of, you know, rational thought where decisions that you're making are made, uh, you know, through the process of reasoning, of thinking, of observing reality, integrating the facts, being objective about those facts, about whether they're true or not. Uh, and analyzing them, figuring out what's right and what's wrong, and then having the integrity to act on them, being honest, not being willing to fake those facts, not to yourself and not to other people, being ruthlessly honest with the facts of reality. I, I think that one of the most important things in life, we spend most of our time there, we gain ultimately most of our self-esteem from from the work we do from a productive endeavor that we do. They, you know, so being productive, taking care of yourself, not being a leech on other people, not expecting other people to serve you, but taking care of your own means, but doing it in something that you love and something you're passionate about. And, and living to the fullest through, you know, through your productive endeavors, through your work, through what you do in life, to, you know, to, to sustain your life. It's really important to love what you do for your productive, you know, for your, for your work, to be productive. You know, and then there's a whole dimension of, you know, in, enjoying, enjoying art and enjoying other people and finding somebody that you can love, finding a soulmate. I, I believe in romantic love. You know, I believe in romantic art and, the, you know, art that projects back to you the full potential of being human. A wonderful life can be. And in spite of my pessimistic tone during the talk, life can be extraordinarily, amazingly wonderful, even in the world we live in today. But you have to embrace it. 
And I think, I think though, the most important thing um, is if, if you want to be happy, now happiness comes from achieving one's values, from setting goals, attaining those goals, working hard, being productive, being honest, being rational and all that. But there's one element that's really, really important. You have to be willing to recognize your own achievements. We are taught that pride is bad, that pride is evil. Pride is really, really, really important for a successful, full, flourishing, happy life. You have to be able to stop and think to yourself, I'm good at this. I'm a good person. I can be the best that I can be. I can be virtuous. You have to be willing to pat yourself on the back. Self-esteem, which I think is essential for happiness, comes from you recognizing your own value, your own achievement. Nobody can give you self-esteem. Certainly, they can't give you self-esteem if they give everybody ribbon. So it's achieving and recognizing for yourself your own achievement. I think that's what a happy, full, successful life. And, it, and in the, again, there are many components. Work is an important one. Relationships, romance, arts, those are aesthetics. Those are all crucial, you know, studying. I, I, find, it, I find it amazing that, that people can be bored. Life is so interesting. There's so many interesting things out there. There's so many books to read, movies to watch, people to meet, things to do. And, and a life that's focused, a life that's oriented towards that, towards I want to embrace it all. I want to live a full life, given these virtues. That, that is what you know, a full life, a, a happy life, a successful life is. Okay. One from here. Uh, I want to ask, kind of, and in so doing, I'll pose two situations. Uh, to what degree should a person not sacrifice themselves to another? And the situations I want to give are, let's say uh, you're on your way to a very competitive job interview, and on the way you see someone get hit by a car, and you know that you could help them in that situation and possibly save their life or miss the interview and possibly lose the opportunity of a really great job. And the other situation is like, uh, say, a country like Heidi gets hit by an earthquake and to what extent should you know a country like the US provide foreign aid in that situation where it's it's you know obviously they have control over the types of buildings they have but in terms of the earthquake happening or not is out of their control. Uh, let's start with the yeah. first question which is to what extent should should a person sacrifice to another? And in my view is you should never, ever, ever, ever sacrifice to another human being or to anything else. Sacrifice, now let's be clear what sacrifice is. Sacrifice means giving up a value and expecting what in return? Nothing or something much less important to you. So sacrifice is a losing proposition. If life is the standard, if everything we do is supposed to enhance our life, make our life better, sacrifice is moving away from life, making our life worse, moving us towards death, which is the alternative ultimately to life. Sacrifice is a losing proposition. It's bad. It's evil, according to objective. Now, is it a sacrifice to stop and help somebody who, whose life, you know, might be given if, if you're, you know, on the way to a job interview? You know, I think it depends on a lot of things. But I think for the most part, it's not. Life is a value to us. It's an important value to us. Now, if I know the guy in the car that just hit the thing is Hitler, or he's somebody who I think is a bad person, I'm off to the interview with no sense of guilt at all. But if it's a stranger, you know, my assumption in America, not in every country in the world, but in America, is he's a good person, he's a productive person. I benefit from his life and him being alive. I benefit from a world in which people like that are alive, in which people don't just dismiss the value of human life. And I'm willing to stop and help somebody. But let me give you, you know, let's make this more extreme. Uh, I've got one of my kids is hurt and they're bleeding in the car and I'm rushing to the hospital and there's an accident and somebody gets hurt. I don't care who that person is. I'm going to the hospital. 
I'm not stopping to help him. So, you know, you're going to have to wait. You know, you're on the verge of starvation. If you don't get this job, you're dead. Go for the job. I mean, but the standard, the important thing here is the standard. The standard is your life. But your life in the fullest sense, where you value living things. I mean, we stop to help injured dogs. I mean, we take care of plants. We certainly should take care of other human beings when it's not a sacrifice. When they are valuable. But, you know, if it's a rational uh, company that you're interviewing with and you explain the circumstances to them, then I don't think you're going to miss the interview, right? <laughs> so... No, I don't. I don't think it is a sacrifice. Now, Haiti, I do think is a sacrifice. I just don't. First of all, the government has no business giving money to Haiti. It's not their money to give. The government's only job, in my view, is to protect our lives and our property, not to take our property and give it to somebody else, even if they think that somebody else is the most best, virtuous, nicest, most deserving person on earth. It doesn't matter. It's not their job now. Should you give money to Haiti? I'd say no. There's nothing to be gained by it. There's plenty of stuff you can do at home for yourself. If you've got excess money and you want to be charitable, then contribute to a charity that affects your life, to something that you will benefit from. This is a, you know, another country. It's a poor country we don't trade with. There's no value for you at stake. I mean, it's sad what happens in state. I mean, you know, you should feel sadness when other people are, are, are hurt and, and dying mass. But it's not your responsibility. Even if it's even if it's not about their building and their responsibility, even if it's just, you know, whatever, you know, something strikes out of nowhere. I'm more likely to help Japan right now than I would be to help Haiti. Haiti needs it more. But I get more from my relationship with the Japanese than I'll ever get from my relationship with Haiti. There's nothing I'll ever get back. Whereas with Japan, I am going to get back the real value. So again, the orientation and it and it in a world that where we are so brought up with altruism, we're so brought up with the virtue of sacrifice and the idea of selflessness. It's hard, but the standard is: is this does this further my life? Is my life better for doing this? That's the standard. Hold, hold your thoughts. We're going to get you guys. I'm going to take a question from uh, our audiences on the internet. Question from the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Are there any key points in U.S. history that led us to a society with values different than those of the founding fathers? Yeah, I, th I think they are. I think that, that it's not an event. It's not a point. It's it's about ideas, and I think that the the key event is the dominance of German Romantic philosophy in Europe. Kant, Hegel, um, Schopenhauer, and, and and the rest of them. The dominance of those ideas, which I think are, are fundamentally opposed to the individualism and freedom that this country stood for. Their dominance in the 19th century is ultimately what led to the decline of the U.S. And how did those ideas get here? They, they were in Europe. They got here through a very simple mechanism. Americans, wealthy Americans in particular, who wanted their kids to get the best education in the world, what would they do? They sent them to Europe. Harvard and Yale and Princeton, who wanted to become some of the best institutions in the world, how did they do that? Well, they hired professors from Germany and France and, and Britain. So the ideas were imported through our intellectuals, through our universities, and through kids who went to Europe to get educated. And that's what begins the process of erosion. That's where the progressive movement ultimately comes from. And, and you see that in the late 19th century. You see it in the legislation. You see it in the attitudes. You see it in the kind of standards presidents and, and the general public start holding. It, we start becoming a land of individuals. And we start becoming, like Europe, a land of collective. We start becoming, you know, Teddy Roosevelt is a good example. He's all about America. He's all about the state, the country. He's not about individuals. And, and of course, draw a line from Teddy Roosevelt 
to John McCain, whose campaign slogan was country first, which is a fascist slogan. That's fascism to place the country first. You are all sheep for the country. We're gonna, you know, we'll slaughter whoever need we need to for the if the country is better off. Country first? Our founding fathers are rolling in their graves. This is about the individual first. The country is our servant. Government is our servant. We are not the servants of the state. We are not its sacrificial lambs. So I'd say it started in the 19th century. It was intellectual. It was about ideas, ideas, ideas. And those ideas, you know, came in through the universities. They came through our educational establishment. It took a long time to corrupt the American public thoroughly. It's taken about a hundred years. But they corrupted us enough so we got a so we got a you know Wilson with the with the income tax and uh League of Nations and the Federal Reserve and then corrupted us enough so that we get FDR and and, and uh you know all the all the New Deal policies and of course it's just gotten worse since then and we've become more and more collectivistic, less and less individualistic. Uh, less and less focused on our lives and our happiness and more and more guilt-ridden because Haiti and people are dying really all over the world and we're not doing anything about it and we should, uh, which is what you know these ideas lead to. They lead to the crippling of the good for the sake of the suffering, good or bad, just because they're suffering. So it's a process and it's fundamentally ideas. It's not an event. Back here, so we're going to take a question back here. Um, by uh, the question you answered about uh, helping Haiti or not helping Haiti, uh, during World War II, the Roosevelt administration disallowed a lot of escaped Jews from the Holocaust from entering the country, and one could argue that that was done in their self-interest. So, by your rationale, do you think that was correct? More no, because I believe that people have a right to emigrate. Uh, or people have a right. We don't have a right to exclude people from this country arbitrarily. Um, the Jews coming to the United States in the 1930s were not a risk to the United States. Um, there, there was no interest that we had to exclude them and to keep them out. And I certainly think they should have been allowed in. I think it's one of the great travesties, one of the great historical travesties, that we didn't allow them in, uh, that we didn't allow the not just the Jews, but but those who wanted to flee Hitler and the atrocities that Hitler was going to commit and was committing uh, to come to this country. Jews, Slovaks, Russians, whatever. Um, you know, remember what it says in the Statue of Liberty. You know, we, we are the land of the free. Now, but I, I'll make it more controversial since you know that's that's an easy one. Should we have entered World War II to save the Jews? Put, imagine Pearl Harbor never happened, and the Jews are being slaughtered in Europe. Should the United States have gone there? Because you know, I'd be a hypocrite if I said yes, they should, because I happen to be from Jewish background. And, but we shouldn't go to you know save the Rwandans. But I'm not going to be a hypocrite. I'm not going to say no. We shouldn't. It was not the United States' job to go to Europe and save the Jews. The only reason to go to Europe is if we believe Hitler was a real threat to the United States, to the lives and property of America. And that's a debate, you know, you could have. But it's not to save Europeans of, of whatever of whatever type. Um, so I don't think wars should be fought for humanitarian grounds. I don't think we should send one soldier to fight for somebody else's freedom, for some other country's freedom. Well, because, 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 of my my views views on, on, because of my views on immigration, there's no reason to keep them out. So let's say, uh, you know, let's say I have relatives in Germany and I want to invite them to come and live with me. How is the government, how does the government have a role in stopping them from coming in? I mean, I'm an American citizen. I have a right to have anybody I want on my property. Who are they to tell me, no, you cannot have this person or that person? So. There was no basis by which to exclude them. There's a big difference by saying, I'm going to risk life and, and uh, you know, and huge amounts of resources and money and so on. 
for the sake of other people versus saying, I'm going to let them come in, no cost to me. Quite the contrary. You know, huge benefits to me because they were, they would have been, you know, productive people in the world, in the people, more people that we could have traded with. And they would have escaped the horrors of World War II, which is ultimately, you know, bad for us. But I don't believe it reaches that level where you say, just because somebody else is fighting a war, and if they didn't fight a war, we'd be better, I'm going to risk people's lives in order to stop that war. You have to make the case. And I think you probably can make the case with regard to Hitler, that it is a real existential threat to America. Only then is it justified to enter a war. We should not be sending out kids to fight wars to, for humanitarian reasons, to save people. And it doesn't matter if it's five people or five million people getting killed. It's not a question of numbers. It's a question of principle. Okay, we're going to take another question from the online audience. Spencer Roan from Cornell asks, Wouldn't your position on these public policies, such as Medicare and welfare, be dependent on what group you're part of. Let's say, for instance, you're a recipient of welfare. Wouldn't it be in your self-interest to be for welfare because it benefits you? That's a great question. And the answer is no. <laughs> but why? Self-interest is not just whatever you feel like. Self-interest is not just whatever can get you cash in your pocket to go and buy some food right now. Self-interest is about living life to its fullest. It's about taking responsibility for your own life. It's about being productive. It's about being rational. It's about engaging in the world. I kind of described that, you know, in an earlier answer. By giving people welfare, we are actually making it impossible for them to live that kind of world. They are the victims of welfare. They cannot flourish. They cannot be successful. They cannot, for example, gain the skills to get a job. So let's take minimum wage. It's an easy one, right? We have minimum wage at 8 bucks 50 What if you're a 16-year-old, you're out of school, you need to work, you know, support yourself, maybe your family, and all you're worth, and in the business world, people are worth something, and companies make a profit over every employee. What if you're only worth 6 bucks an hour? Because you're not that productive. You're not that talented. You're not that educated. You only worth six bucks an hour. That means you're never going to have a job. Now, if you got a job at six bucks an hour, then you would learn skills and you would get better. And one day you'd make eight, and one day you'd make 10, and maybe you'd make 20. And if you were really ambitious and talented, you might become the store manager and you might run the whole company one day. Certainly in the 19th century, lots of people, you know, the Carnegie's and the Mellons and the uh, Vanderbilt started with nothing. Nothing much poorer than any poor person today. And they rose up and made something of themselves. So they, the sky's the limit. But if you can't start, if society tells you, if you're not worth $8.50, we're going to pay you not to work, which is what welfare does, what the minimum wage does. We're going to pay you not to work because you know what? We feel sorry for you. You're pathetic. That is destructive. That's not helpful. You're not helping anybody. You're increasing unemployment and you're destroying the spirit of those people. So it's not in their self-interest to take welfare. What's in their self-interest is to have a thriving, free, capitalist economy in which they can thrive and succeed and rise up. Now, what if you're about to retire, you paid into the system, you've been told forever that you're going to get Medicare and Social Security and so on, and then Iran comes along, and just pulls the rug from under you and takes it all away. That I agree. I think that would be wrong. When you, you know, if you're 65 or 70 and, and, you know, you paid into the system, it's your money. Uh, you've been led to believe that this will exist. That's not how you solve the problem. You don't solve the problem. We're just taking it away from them all at once. This is something that has to be phased out over time. We need to tell 20 year olds that they won't have social security that they won't have Medicare and Medicaid. 40-year-olds, that they'll get a little bit. 60-year-olds maybe get everything. And then you slowly, so that in 40 years, there is no Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. But nobody expected it. Nobody ta was taxed in order to, to provide for, you know, this so-called trust fund, this mythical trust fund that Social Security had. 
It's all out on the table. Everybody knows what's going on. So it, it, it takes time to transition. But you don't have self-interest is, again, not about what's momentary. It's about what life, a full, complete life requires on you. And you can't get that. You can't get, you know, uh, you can't get happiness. You can't get flourishing from being a leech on somebody else. It's not possible. So you are those who advocate for welfare because they're receiving welfare. Businessmen who advocate for subsidies are self-destructing. They're doing themselves harm. The thing businessmen should strike towards is to advocate for capitalism, advocate for freedom. Advocate for a real competitive market in which they can match wits with their competitors. And, and, you know, that's where you get the self-esteem. If you're getting the subsidies, you're never going to be a flourishing, successful, full of self-esteem type of CEO. You're going to know that you cheated because it's cheating. Cheating doesn't work. Cheating doesn't, you know, lead to self-esteem. Lying, cheating, stealing don't lead to self-esteem. Don't lead a happiness, so therefore not in your self-interest. And if there's a question, I can elaborate on why lying is bad for you. Is there a question here? Um, Jennifer Sun, University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, asks, how can we, as students, apply the concepts you've spoken of to in our everyday lives, such as to the classes that we take? Well, I mean, I think these principles are exactly the kind of principles that need to be applied for day-to-day -day life. Ayn Rand called her philosophy a philosophy for living on Earth. It's a philosophy for living day-to-day -day lives, so making decisions about your life every single day. You need to sit down and figure out what I want to do in life. What's really important to me in life as a student? You know, what is my passion? And then structure the classes you take, you know, the kind of courses you want to do, the direction you take according to that. And there are going to be classes you're going to be forced to take because, you know, the university has decided you have to take some boring class that's irrelevant to what you actually want to do in life. You know, and the fact is that that class is going to be a lot, should be a lot less important to you than the class that is really crucial to what you want to do in life. And I would spend the necessary amount of time to pass the one class, and I would spend an extraordinary amount of time on the other one to really excel at the other class because it is essential. But that's true of, of the relationships you have with people around you. I mean, who... Who are good people around you? Good people in the sense that they, they, they reflect back the kind of values that you believe in, that you think are good. Who's going to help you be a better person? Not by helping you, by giving you cash, but by their own example. Who can you benefit from the most? So your relationships, the classes you take. I mean, even your relationship to, um, you know, to your family, to your parents. I mean. You have to be objective about those things. How important are they? Are they important? How much time should I spend? Do I owe them anything? Right? Because our parents think we owe them everything. Right? We don't. We don't owe them. The fact is, kids don't owe their parents anything. Parents owe the kids something. They owe them, you know, to, to help raise them until they're 18. Or until whatever their legal age happens to be. Raise them well until that's the responsibility that a parent takes on when they have a child. You didn't ask to come into this world. You don't owe your parents anything. Now, if you love them, if you respect them, great. That's wonderful. Spend time with them. You know, value them. That's wonderful. But if, what if you don't like them? You don't owe them anything. You don't owe them. So be rational. Be objective about every aspect of your life as a student and as a human being. Um, and, and again, take the time to think about what's really important to you and take the time to acknowledge your own worth and your own success when they're real. You really have earned the success and earned that worth. Take the time to reflect on that because that's what's going to 
allow you to have the self-esteem, the pride, and ultimately the happiness to really go through life and be successful. We'll get, we'll get to, well, actually, let me do one more, and then we'll get an audience, one from the live audience next. Um, don't have a school, but the question is, is belief in God incongruent with objectivism? I ask this in light of what you say about our founding fathers. It's my understanding that many of our founding fathers were religious, or as Rand would put them, mystics. So I don't think the founding fathers were objectivists. Let's be very clear. They couldn't have been. Ayn Rand was born, you know, a hundred and some years after the founding of the country. So the philosophy of objectivism didn't exist at the time of the founding fathers. And we can debate how religious the founding fathers were. I think a significant number of them weren't very religious. Uh, many of them were deists. Um, you know, potentially some were even atheists. But, you know, that's not the point. They weren't objectivists. They were about as good as you could be, I think. As good as you could be in the late 18th century, given the knowledge, given the philosophy, uh, given what came before them, given, you know, their circumstances. They were about as best as you could be. I mean, they are geniuses and they are giants and they deserve our fullest respect, even if we disagree with them on this or that. And we certainly disagree with them. I disagree with Jefferson more on, you know, on, on public education. I disagree with a bunch of different things. And certainly, you know, the, some of the Founding Fathers' attitude towards slavery. There are lots of things to disagree with the Founding Fathers while acknowledging their genius and their greatness. So you can't use them you know, I, I compliment them all the time on their political philosophy, which I think was revolutionary and really striking. But they didn't have it all. They didn't have the right ethics. They certainly didn't have the right epistemology and the right metaphysics. They couldn't have had it. Nobody had thought of it yet. Ayn Rand was the one who thought of these things. Now, to be an objectivist, I do not believe that you can believe in God. Because to be an objectivist means a commitment, a hundred percent commitment, unwavering commitment to reason, to the facts of reality, to what exists, to evidence, to object objectivity. And the fact is that God is outside of that. God requires faith, no matter how you define it, no matter how you present it, at the end of the day, there's no evidence for this being. There's no facts that suggest his existence. You have to say, in spite of the fact that there's no facts, I'm going to believe it anyway. That's faith. And that's a negation of reason. And while many people, like the founders, can still be great political philosophers and still do that, and I'd rather have the founding fathers around than pretty much anybody else, right? That's not objectivism. Um, that's not objectivism. So objectivism is, put it positively rather than negative, a, 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 an absolute commitment to reason in everything, including in the question of, you know, how did this world come about? What created it? Where do we as human beings come from? All of that is the answer needs to come from reason. It needs to come from science. It needs to come from rational thought. Um, and so that, so yeah, the answers is they're incompatible in spite of our deep respect for the founding. Yeah, um, I'm a proud Tea Party member and have been to a number of events in several states. And the way that it, it sort of seems to have unfolded is that we've been defined by the media, um, always in negative uh, terms. And actually, tying into your but your last answer was uh, a decent number uh, statistically are evangelicals or Christians. I don't, I'm not personally, but many of them are. And yet we, and the objectivist um, mindset, we're on the same page in so many issues. And I wanted to know what your experiences were about with um, the Tea Party, if there have been any, and also if you think that we'll be able to overcome this media uh, definition of ourselves, which I have found to be completely untrue. So, so the question is really about about the Tea Party. So let me start by saying that I think the Tea Party phenomena is phenomenal. <laughs> it's really, really good. And it's good in this sense. Americans stood up and said, enough is enough. We've had it. You're encroaching on our freedoms too much. You know, government is growing too big. We want you out of our lives. 
enough is enough. And, and, and they brought back the Constitution, which was not a very sexy topic before. And now everybody's talking about the Constitution. And that's all really, really good. And generally, I think Tea Party members are, in a sense, real American. They're grounded in the American sense of life and what it means to be an individualistic American, at least at the emotional level. That is, that is the case. And, and I've had a lot of experience with the Tea Party people. I've given a lot of talks in front of a variety of different Tea Party groups. Um, there's a problem, though, with the Tea Party. And this is why they are open to, to, to criticism from the media. And the problem is that it's not an intellectual movement. It's an emotional movement. It's primarily an emotional response. For most Tea Party members that I've encountered, they want smaller government, for example. They want government out of their lives. Well, once you start listing the programs, they're very, very hesitant to name any ones that they'd actually cut or any ones that they would feel comfortable passionately advocating should be cut. Um, when you ask them, what should be the standard for cutting programs? How do we decide which to keep them? They don't know. The standard, in my view, should be, does it protect individual rights or doesn't it? If it doesn't, it should go. If it does, keep it. And there are very few things that we keep in that scenario. They have this understanding of the Constitution, which I think is generally superficial. And, and generally, they quote a lot, but they don't have the philosophical understanding of the Enlightenment roots of that document. And, and, and to me, there's one concept, there's one concept that is missing that if the Tea Party somehow got it would change the history of the, the future of the United States in a, in a deep way. And that is individual rights. Nobody talks about individual rights. And this is why I believe they don't understand the Constitution. The Constitution to them is some document written by the gods, the founding fathers. Um, and it's flawless, and it somehow reveals the truth to us. When that's not, in, in, that's not what the document is. It's a legal document put together by a group of men who, who come from a particular tradition of the Enlightenment thinking, uh, you know, come from a, a deep understanding of individual rights, and the document is shaped by the Declaration of Independence, a document nobody ever comes to. So the Tea Parties lack this intellectuality, and therefore they leave themselves open for influence from the religious right, which I think is very anti-intellectual, not just non-intellectual, but anti-intellectual, and, you know, so the evangelical right, the, 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 the do away with the separation of church and state. They leave themselves all from the pragmatist Republicans who just want, you know, everything to continue as it was before and don't walk the boat to it. And those are the influences influencing, and they're also open to what I think is kind of the populism of a Sarah Palin. No real ideas. You know, we hate the Wall Street, we hate the drug companies just like Obama does, but we're for freedom and we're for, you know, the founding fathers. What does that mean? She has no and that's why the media can latch on and, and portray them in such a negative term. And, the, and the, the future, and so there's a sudden, I think the media is wrong, and I think they way overdo it, but there's a sudden legitimacy to it. It's not, the, the Tea Party is not deep intellectually, and it needs it, and it doesn't have intellectual leadership. If the Tea Party can find that intellectual leadership, if they can discover the concept of individual rights, and, and make, put that on their banner, that should be the banner. Um, and they understand that concept, then I, then I think the media will have to back off because uh, because this is this is going to be a serious group. They can really talk about serious things and really challenge both Republicans and Democrats on the core issues, not on superficial issues. But it really needs to become more intellectual, and that's a challenge. And that's why I go to speak there because because it's not going to become intellectual like that. It needs those ideas, and somebody you know we all have to go out there and and, and talk about those ideas. But we need to talk about ideas, not just about emotions and not just about superficial stuff that we can do. Okay, another question from our uh, online audience. Jeff from the University of Wisconsin in Whitewater asks, both egoism and altruism claim life as the God or as the good. It just varies on whose life they're talking about. Why should one choose life at all? There is no why. To choosing life. But if you don't choose life, fine. You know, I think we're on the fourth floor here. You can open one of the windows and we can we can end it. Um, so morality doesn't start 
according to Rand, until you choose life. Because only that choice of living makes the choice of values, which, which is what morality is about, possible. There is no values in pursuit of death. Only thing in pursuit of death is death. There's no morality relevant to somebody who chooses not to live. So there is no why you choose life other than it's pretty good. Once in a while, I'm so to speak. Rare. <laughs> Question from University of Colorado, Denver. How is it not better for us in the long term to help those in need, which then makes those benefits more likely to help us in the future, which can serve the standard of life? It's a little bit a little clunky, but I guess the, the meaning is, how is, how is it not benefit, better for us to help those in need long term? Because those benefits can circle back reciprocate back at yeah, us. But that's 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 just nonsense. You know, if 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 I'm worried about losing my job one day or about uh, you know about something really really bad happening to me, that's what insurance is for. I can go out and buy an insurance policy against disability. You, in a free market, my guess is you'll be able to buy insurance against a lot of different things, and you can go and you know participate in, in a voluntary insurance pool, which secures you from bad stuff happening to you. But you know, I'm I'm pretty confident in life, and I I I believe that because I'm you know I'm talented and because I work hard, that my life, from a financial perspective, will only get better in the future. And I'll buy insurance for the catastrophe, and I want to live. So helping somebody else doesn't rebound to me. I mean, I don't. I'm never going to use welfare ever. It's just not going to happen. Um, so. There's no, and, and what right do you have? Because this isn't about voluntary pools in which we participate. I help you, you help me. No, this is forced pools, right? I'm forced to help you, whether I'm going to benefit from it or not, what I think I'm going to benefit from it or not. And I'm never going to, you know, if, if, um, if I'm forced to participate in the scheme and I never use it, then I'm a loser. Um, you know, if I do use it, then, you know, somebody else is being forced to pay for my life. That's not right, that other people are forced in order to, to, to pay for me. You know, that doesn't enhance my life in any kind of significant way or, or at all. It's just, it's just wrong. And it's wrong because it uses force, you know, to extract stuff from some people and give it to others. And it's wrong because it makes this assumption that we're all going to, we're all equally likely to have bad stuff happen to us. And I don't believe that. I think some people are more likely to have bad stuff happen to them. They, you know, they should take care of themselves and, and, and work that that stuff doesn't happen to them. And if it does happen to them, it's their problem. It's not mine. Now, there's an essence in which I like helping people. And that is I like to help productive people. If, if somebody productive who's a basically a good person, something bad happens to them, their house burns down, they didn't have insurance for some reason. Yeah, absolutely, I'd help them. And we have a long tradition in America of helping those people, you know, uh, uh, building the bar, you know, the, going out, all the neighbors coming together and building the house for somebody who burned down. But you don't do it because when your house will burn down, they'll help you. Because you don't plan for your house burning down. What you do is you do it because they're good people. And you know that if they're successful, their success will rebound on you. I'm a trader. I'm a believer in win-wins. Not lose, lose, or lose wins, or if I lose that. I believe in win wins. I want to help other people become more productive so that I can be more productive. I want to help other people produce the next, you know, I promise not to use the iPhone in this talk. So, you know, <laughs> I want them to produce the next great innovation that I can benefit from. I want people to go out there and work so that I can trade with them so my life would be better. I'm focused on the positive, not on the negative. The negatives are rare. If you're a productive, good human being, then rare. Accidents are rare. You need to buy insurance to protect yourself against them, and then you need to forget them and focus on the good stuff and focus on promoting the good and, and working and helping those people who deserve your help, which are people who are productive, people who contribute to your life in one way or another. Question from Elan at Princeton. Dr. Brooke, thank you for speaking to us today. You've argued against income redistribution programs in healthcare like Medicare, suggesting individual charity as an alternative. 
Should we similarly fund the military through voluntary contributions? Why or why not? So first, my alternative is not charity. I don't believe charity is the alternative. Charity is a side issue. It's irrelevant. What the alternative is taking care of yourself. The alternative is getting a job, saving money, and buying insurance. And in a in a free market, insurance is cheap. You only buy it for catastrophic stuff. As I said, you only buy it for the real bad stuff. And save, and work, and live. So I'm not about charity. Yeah, charity will take care of the of the people at the margins, the very very tiny fraction of people who really can't take care of themselves. But if you can take care of yourself, take care of yourself. You know, so I don't believe in this huge, you know, that we'll need huge amounts of charity. A free society is charitable, but doesn't need much charity. Because in a free society, people take care of themselves. And it's not that hard at all. And, and, and partially, ask the immigrants who came to this country in the 19th century with nothing. Nothing. They had nothing in Europe. They were being killed over there. So they got on boats and came over here with nothing. They had no relatives here. They had nothing over here. And they worked their butts off. There was no safety net. There was no social security. There was no Medicare. There was nothing. And yet, they lived incredible lives because they took care of themselves. They raised their kids. They saved. What a concept. They saved. They thought long term. And they put money aside to take care of themselves and of their kids. And they sent them to good schools. And then within a generation or two, their kids were middle class or, or, or rich. And maybe in less than two generations. You don't need charity. You don't need a social safety net to protect you. A tiny fraction, a tenth of one percent, maybe a hundredth of one percent needs charity, and charity will be there for them. The rest of us don't need it. So I just want to correct uh, Elon's uh, assumption that I think charity will replace it. Now, how would we fund the military, which is the fundamental question? And the answer is yes. The military should be funded by voluntary taxation. That is, everybody should. Write a check to the government to fund the, mili- to fund the military. Um, I don't believe in compulsory taxation. I think that's the equivalent of theft. So rational people who care about their lives, and, and we're only going to get to a free country where there's even a question of how to fund the military if we're rational and care about our lives. Rational people who care about their lives would be eager, happy to write a check to the government. And I bet you you'd raise every year more than the military needed. And they'd have to refund some of the money because people would be so eager to pay for stuff that they get it. And the richer you are, you're probably likely to write a bigger check. Why? You've got more assets that need protecting. You've got more to lose, at least in terms of physical stuff. And that's true of the police. That's true of the judiciary. That's true of the military. The three things I think government should be funded. I don't believe in privatizing police and government. You know, I don't believe in competing I be, uh, on the same geographic area. I believe in a government. There should be a government. But that government should be funded primarily through voluntary taxation. And will there be free riders? Free riders are people who don't pay and benefit from the fact that most of us do pay? Yes. Do I care? Not so much. Is there a way to deal with free riders? Absolutely. I think what the government should do is, is, is publish on the Internet the names of everybody who's paid. And if you see it, if you see that your neighbor's not on there, don't talk to him. Don't sell him stuff in your store. Don't employ him. There's no right to be employed. There's no right. Shun him. Let's use social shunning uh, in order to get rid of those people who are free riders. There are pl- plenty of ways, short of pulling out a gun and forcing somebody to participate, to put, you know, to, to, to put healthy pressure on people to do what they should be doing in work. Uh, so, yes, I believe in, in complete voluntary taxation. And I think it would be easy and trivial to raise the kind of money. I mean, we're not talking about a lot of money here. Not the kind of military I would have. It would be small and incredibly powerful. And we wouldn't be afraid to use it. Why don't we take a couple of questions here because we're being patient. And then we'll get to the guy in the back. I would give charity to any cause, and but it was from my own will and not due to any societal obligations. I, would would you say that's not in my self interest, even though I really wanted to do that? In other words, is self interest is there like a general definition for self interest, or do we all define it ourselves? Well, it would depend on what what generated that will, right? Was it just a whim, an emotion of the moment, 
I'd say that's not self-interest. Self-interest is what is really good for you in the long term, rationally thought out. Now, I can think of lots of scenarios where giving charity is consistent with that definition. That giving charity is good for me in the long run for my life. It will make my life better in the long run. And it really will depend on your personal values. So there's not one charity that we all have to give to you. The objective of charity that you have to give to you. We are different. We don't exactly have the same values. Um, but, but there are lots of, lots of causes. First of all, you, you, might have, um, you might have a family member who something horrible has happened to and can't take care of themselves anymore. And you, you, you love this person. You had a relationship with this person. It's, it's good for you to help this person because of that love, because of that. That's a positive. You might, uh, you, you might want to give uh, you know, money to uh, medical research in certain, in certain fields, partially because if they cure that, your life would be better off and there's the potential for you to be cured or your children or your people that you love and the people that you care about. I, you know, I really love babies. You know, it, it, I think they're really cute. And they, they, are, they have this incredible human potential, right? Um, I, you know, if I had money, and, I, you know, that would be a charity that I would support, orphan children or something like that, because I think I get a value from that. I get a value from helping human beings that are going to be productive. And I do it under the assumption that these kids, that in that sense, that they're, they're not bad people. They can't be because they're too small. They have this incredible potential of being productive. So <laughs> you have to rationally make that, those decisions about what is consistent with your long-term well-being and what is inconsistent with your long-term being. Generally, acting on whim, doing just what you feel like doing, is inconsistent with your long-term well-being. There's no difference in that sense, in a principled sense, between saying, the cocaine is here, I feel like doing it, or I feel like giving to that charity. The principle is the same. You're doing it because you, you have this whim, you have this momentary, it's meaningless in terms of your long-term life. Now, the cocaine is probably more harmful to you than that, but the principle is what's really harmful. You want to get away from instant gratification. And there's nothing wrong with instant gratification if it's towards a long term. And that's true, that's true of, of the kind of relaxation and the kind of games you play and so on. I'm not saying don't get the instant gratification of computer games, but do it with the idea that, yeah, we need to relax, we need to play. Play is important to our life within limits. If we do it X number of hours a day, and well, Hours, but X a number of minutes a day, and don't let it dominate our lives. Question from Justin Malone at UC Berkeley. Justin asks, as far as Libya, I must ask, cannot a Randian self-interested perspective be compatible with improving the world? Isn't it better for us to live in a world where all the countries are civilized? We could trade with them, have a smaller military, even emigrate if the U.S. government makes too many bad laws. Oh, absolutely. It would be great. I am 100% in support of a free, capitalist, rights-respecting Libya. The question is, would I risk my life for that? If it was even possible. We're not talking about a rights-respecting, free, anything Libya. And if I want to risk my life for it, I could go volunteer. I could probably find a fisherman in Italy who would smuggle me into India, into Libya, and I could go fight with the rebels to free Libya and turn them into this wonderland. The question fundamentally is, do I have a right to force you to fight for Libya? And I think it's wrong. You cannot bring about a world which respects rights by not respecting rights. You're not going to bring about a free world by not respecting the freedom of Americans, of the people where you are. So yes, we all want that world, and it, you know, if you love Libya so much that you want to go fight for it, go for it. I don't think it's in your self-interest, by the way. Uh, but yeah, we have a self-interest in, in making the world a better place, but not in sacrificing. It goes back to the original question about sacrifice. Um, now, you know, I would even say this in the case of Libya. There was a time where you could argue quite clearly in the 1980s and early 90s that Muammar Gaddafi was a threat to the United States. He killed Americans. This guy deserves to die. And if Ronald Reagan had had the guts 
to kill him in the 1980s, we would be we would be living in a much safer world today. And he didn't. He bombed an, he bombed a tent where he knew Muammar Gaddafi wasn't there. I know you know the, there's a famous story about uh, you know the United States bombed Gaddafi in, in the 1980s after uh, he was it was clearly he was responsible for bombing of uh, a, a discotheque in Berlin where U.S. soldiers were killed, and he was responsible for a bunch of terrorism. And we bombed him, and we were flying. The U.S. was flying out of Britain and had to fly over France. So we asked the French for permission to fly over them to bomb Libya, and the French said no. And everybody's assumption is, well, wimpy French, they just want to, you know, suck up to, to, to Muammar Gaddafi. But that's not what actually happened. The French, uh, what the French said was, if, you're, if you will commit to us that the purpose of the mission is to kill Gaddafi, you can fly over us. But if you're just going there to pinprick this guy and just piss him off some more and not do really anything about him, then we don't want to be involved. That's the wimpiest strategy ever. The French, the French don't, you know, the French, when they get involved, they're the ones bombing Gaddafi's compound right now. It's not the Americans. Because, you know, when they go to war, at least in modern time, they, you know, they usually lose still. But they don't do it in a wimpy way as we do. We lose and we're wimps starting start to finish. Um, if we had killed Gaddafi back then, it would have been completely justified. It would have been good for the world because he was trying to kill Americans. The fact is that right now he's not trying to kill Americans. And the fact is, just to put this in proportion, there's a country in the Middle East that's killing its own civilians, that's building nuclear weapons. They pray every Friday death to the Satan, which is the United States. They want to destroy our allies. They, they fund terrorism all the time. And they get a pass. They get a pass. And that's what illustrates how altruistic, how self-sacrificial this Libyan thing is. Instead of going to Iran and destroying that regime, which is a true threat to the United States, we go after somebody who was a threat 20 years ago but is no longer. A th He's still a threat to his own people, but not a threat to us. We have no foreign policy and a strategy. If we, if the United States had a real foreign policy, if we were committed to destroying anybody who wanted to kill us, and, and, you know, not just wanted, a lot of people want, but it was actually engaging in activities that would lead us, lead them to kill Americans. If we utterly destroyed them and were unequivocal about who our enemies and who our friends were, if we had a foreign policy that did not deal with dictators and authoritarian regimes, because it's not in our interest to deal with them, and they could go to hell. Right? If we protected our oil that we discovered in the Arabian Peninsula, that they stole from us. Right? Since when does oil belong to the king of Saudi Arabia? It belongs to the people who drilled for it and who found it, which are the oil companies. If we had a foreign policy that stood up to all these things, then the world would be free. Because they'd look at us and say, we want to be like those guys. And then the, the riots in Egypt and the demonstrations in Egypt wouldn't be to establish a, you know, what I think is going to happen is establish a, 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 a significantly religious state, uh, an Islamic state, not, not maybe as radical as Iran, but moving in that direction. It would be truly to establish freedom because they'd have a model for freedom. If we want the world to be a better place, this is where we need to fight. And the fight here is not a weapons fight. It's an ideological fight. The world would be a hundred times better, a million times better, if the United States was what it can and should be, if the United States returned to its founding principles. They would then want to emulate. The problem is we have no foreign policy. We have no coherent strategy. We're willing to sacrifice for everything, and we're destroying internally the principles that allow us to do that. There's, there's a question in the back. Why shouldn't the military be privatized? What is fundamentally different from that and other things? So the fundamental difference between the military and police is the fact that they are instruments of force. Force is the anti-reason. It, 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 it inhibits human survival. It's evil. Force is evil. The initiation of force is wrong. It, and it, it's wrong because 
what's required for human existence, what's required for human flourishing is the human mind, is the ability to think and act on those thoughts. Reason, uh, force negates that. It tells you it doesn't matter what you think. You have to do what I tell you to do. Otherwise, I'm going to blow you up. I don't care what reason tells you. This is the truth. This is what you got to do. It's the opposite. It's the opposite of markets. Markets are about freedom, about trading, win-win, right? Force is the antithesis of markets, the antithesis of reason, the antithesis of human existence. You can't compete on that. That's not something you can create a market in the anti-market. It doesn't work. It's incredibly destructive. It's, it, it self-destructs. What you need to do with force is move it out of society, create one entity that monopolizes it, that just controls it. And keeps it out of human existence. The whole purpose of government, at least the American government, the whole purpose of government generally is to monopolize the use of force, to extract force from society. That's a good thing. A good government extracts the use of force from society and then only uses it in retaliation, only uses it in self defense, never uses it, you know, initiates it. But again, it's not a tradable commodity, it's not like another good. It's not another human characteristic. This is evil. You cannot trade in evil. You cannot market in evil. And, you know, it just doesn't work, right? Competing militaries, I have my military, you have more military. What does that lead to? It leads to warfare, gang warfare. That's all it does. Just go to Somalia and see what anarchy does when you have competing militaries. Tribalism, collectivism, uh, all of that is going to flourish under those kind of societies. And you're going to get authoritarianism. There's no question in my mind that anarchy, the private police forces, private militaries leads to authoritarianism or to complete annihilation of civilization. Question from the University of Chicago. Let's say somebody comes up with a cure for cancer. It's in their best interest to try and control the wealth of society as they bleed the country dry via the price of the cure. How does objectivism prevent tyranny? I, don't, I, I guess I don't get why it's tyranny. I come up with a cure for cancer. I have, you know, I have a right, a legal right to burn it and never to use it. I don't think that's moral. I don't think that would be right. It wouldn't be the way I'd further my life. How would I further my life the best? By selling it. And would I charge such a price that nobody could afford it? What do I gain by that? I'm, I'm not going to become rich. The whole point is to charge a price where lots of people can afford it. So I can make lots of money. Right? So. What does it even mean to bleed the country dry? You know, I, I'm bleeding, you know, I need to charge that amount that allow me to make a lot of money and that lots of people are going to use. Now, let's flip this around. You have cancer. I have the cure. Does that give you a right to my cure? I invented the cure. I have the pill right here. It's my pill. Do you have a right to it? You don't have a right to my stuff. You don't have a right to what I invented. If we can trade, great. If we can't trade, sad for you. It's unfortunate. But that's reality. That's the fact. You can't, once you allow the cancer patient to pull out a gun and force me to provide him with the cure, then the gun force is open in society. Anytime I want something and you have it, I'm going to pull out a gun and take it. And we've legitimized that. And indeed, that's what we've done in society. Um, so, there's no tyranny here. This is what freedom is. Indeed, the opposite is tyranny. When you force drug companies to provide drugs for free or to, drug, or to price them low, that's tyranny. That's taking away choices. Uh, now, you know, you could talk about the fact that, you know, if I price it right and it's a huge audience, I can take, I can take the money, I can fund R&D, I can create more drugs, I can create more cures, I can, you know, ultimately help more people, I uh, can make even more money. Uh, but I'm doing it because it's in my self-interest. And, and take another dimension of this. You know, most drug companies would probably have a charitable part where they do help people who can't afford it within, within limits. Because we have an interest in supporting human life. People are basically good. So, but they don't have to do that. There's no moral imperative that they do. Yep. One more, if there is any in the audience here, and then one more from online. Do we have any anyone else in the audience locally? I think you already got one. Let me make sure to capture everybody. Over there. 
Good evening, Dr. Brooke. Uh, I'm in a philosophy class right now, and I'm very vocal in that class. And a student in that class would like to talk to me over spring break. He's he's a he's essentially an ideological Christian as well as a libertarian. And I'm I'm kind of wondering when it. I mean, he came to me and wanted to talk. Yeah. At at what point in a conversation with someone who's interested in your ideas, but has conflicting ideas, how do you know when to just stop? And I don't move know. on. <laughs> when you figure it out, let me know. Um, you know, because you you have to evaluate the use of your time and 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 how is it best used. And if you if you feel like if you have if you feel like you're just hitting up against a brick wall and nothing is getting through, then it, it, and, and and the person is evading. They don't want to look. But that doesn't mean that you're talking to somebody and they just get it. That just is not going to happen. What you're trying to do is lay a certain foundation for them to go home and think about it and maybe slightly moderate their position so that the next conversation becomes more productive. But if you if you have a conversation with a person and then they go home and think about it and then the next conversation is exactly the same as the first one, there's nothing stuck, nothing has changed, then you're probably wasting your time. But don't expect, this is a huge mistake objectivists make, don't expect just because you got it that everybody's going to get it, and they're going to get it as fast as you in exactly the same way as you do. This takes time. This is hard stuff. This is not easy, particularly for philosophy students. It's hard for them. Um, you know, and, and the more you think deeply, the harder it's going to be because the more questions come about. Philosophy is hard. It's not an easy topic. I'm not a philosopher. It's hard stuff. You know, that's why, you know, I only do some of the philosophy because it's just easy stuff that I kind of understand. But Philosophy, the deeper you go, is the, is really difficult. So you have to respect that. You have to respect their context of knowledge. And you have to respect that learning takes time. Changing one's mind takes time. I, when I read Atlas Shrugged, I was a socialist, I was a Zionist, and I was an altruist. Explicitly. I, in here, I was committed to those three ideas, i.e. altruism, collectivism, and socialism. It doesn't get any worse, right? You know, if somebody would have come to me and started blabbermouthing about objectivism, about capitalism, I would have, you know, I would have ignored them. Now, luckily, I read Atlas Shrugged, and you slowly get drawn into it. And you get a speech, and there's a mystery, and you get another speech, and you kind of say, that makes sense, and that makes sense, and you argue with it. And that make, and you, by the time John Galt's speech comes around, you know, that's it. And then, then there's 70 pages to convince you, but it's time and effort and, and a lot of thinking. It took me a long time to read Atlas Shrugged the first time because I fought it. I wouldn't believe a word because it, it seemed completely nuts to me. It, it contradicted everything that I'd been brought up to believe and uh, that, I, that I believed at that point in time. So you have to take into account that, that people have different starting points. Some people read out the show and say, aha, this is what I felt all along. I knew this. This is how I wanted to live my life. Nothing here contradicts my, my That did not happen to me. So I have a lot more sympathy for people who struggle with this because it's hard. And it's hard to shake off. It took me years to shake off, you know, getting teary-eyed when the Israeli flag would go up into the thing or, or being or feeling sorry for people from, from the altruism thing. The fact that you change your ideas takes a long time to completely undo all this stuff. So this is hard work. And, you, and, and if you want to help somebody, you have to, you have to be willing to, to be patient now, I'm not saying at some point you have to say enough's enough, but you have to be willing to be patient to realize that this is a process and that they have to do the thinking for themselves. You can't do it for them. Jonathan Taylor, Texas A&M University, have the last question for tonight. Perfect. I want to text him. <laughs> <laughs> what can one do on a local level and then an individual level to win the future? Well, I think that, that, that the two things, uh, I, and you have to start with the individual level. You have to start with what you, you need to do with yourself. And that is what you need to do with yourself is live the best life that you can live for yourself. Understand the philosophy. Understand how it applies to your life and live it. You know, make the most of your life and be committed to that. You're not going to be able to go out there and convince anybody if you're not living it. You just come off as a hypocrite. Uh, and if you don't understand it, you need to understand it, at least at a certain level. Um, then I think if you want, if you want to change the world, you have to go out and fight for it. It, it means, it means 
talking to people. It means trying to convince them. It means moving them. It means, it means engaging with the world, engaging with ideas, but, but understanding that it's fundamental ideas that change the world. It's not the particular solution to social security. You need that as well. But you need to understand why social security is, is, is immoral. It's wrong. It, it, it's, uh, you know, it's a violation of rights. Uh, you need to understand those things. You need to fight at that level. There are plenty of people who do kind of the economic stuff. You know, and, but stay always committed to your own values. And I think fighting, I don't think, you know, I used to think fighting was optional. I don't think fighting is that optional anymore. I think the world's too far gone to be on the sidelines. I think that once you get it, and once you get your life in order, you got to go out there and, and fight for your life because the, the future is not guaranteed. Fifty years ago, everything was, you know, there's some smoothness to American life. The next generation was always better off than the previous one. And, and the, 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 the risks were, seemed distant. They're not, they're not distant anymore. At least they don't seem distant anymore. Uh, it's time to, it's time to fight for, for what you believe in. And that means speak. It, it, there's no alternative. On the elevator, in the classroom, to your buddies, to, to people you don't know, in the tea, whether you get involved in the tea parties or whether you get involved in local politics or national politics or, or, or whatever the group or the, or the forum or the format it is, talk, 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 you know, try to educate, try to influence. Don't expect miracles. Don't expect people to just convert like that. Just try to influence. Move them along. Try to make them better than they were five minutes ago. If you can make people incrementally better, have better ideas, then and if, if all of us dedicate ourselves to doing that, um, you know, I, I think this battle, in spite of the long odds, is winnable. Thank you. Thank you.